hotties. Today we have a guest who has been held as magical by the New York Times and amazing by Wayne Brady. Trained as an opera singer and theater performer, she's graced iconic venues like the Hollywood Magic Castle, the Lincoln Center, and Carnegie Hall. Welcome to the show, Cassandra Ruiz. This is so strange because we speak every day, almost. Yes, exactly. We watch that a lot, multiple voice notes. And my main reason for having it on is because I feel like we have so much in common, but there's been so many things that are like, oh, me too, or oh, this too. But we're just living completely different lives in different states. I thought it would be cool to share our different perspectives on the same stuff. We're both magicians, <laughs> but we both do a lot of other stuff. Can you share your journey like even getting into entertainment so not just magic but like first live performance sure so um my dad was actually a uh, actor so mm -hmm. i kind of had a little bit of that in my bones and my mom is a visual artist she paints so they were always super supportive and they were like, oh, what do you love? So they put me on stage just for fun to see if I would like dancing when I was three and bam, that was it. Apparently I said this, I don't want to leave. And my mom was like, okay, apparently she's a performer. Cool. So <laughs> that was my first little foray into performing. And then from then on, it was just, I did all the theater things, anything mm -hmm. anybody would let me do, um, whether it was singing, it was dancing, it was acting. I was in every class doing all of the theater stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then as I got older, I focused more heavily on singing. I went to college, I went to a conservatory for music um, where I studied opera and musical theater. And then I graduated school and found magic and was like, wow, I could tell my own stories while doing magic and also incorporating my background of theater and singing and um, all of that. So that was kind of the thing that brought me into magic, but it's been a lifelong journey of performing. Did you straight away, like as soon as you found magic, incorporate magic with the singing or were you, did you stop that, do magic and then combine them? So I think it was at first little bits here and there because I actually got my start as a magician doing um, restaurant magic. So I was mm -hmm. doing scrolling magic close up mm -hmm. at, at tables at a upscale uh, restaurant in Manhattan. And then as I was doing that and I was watching other people and kind of getting what my inspiration was for magic, <laughs> I was watching the old David Copperfield, like doing the grand illusions, but also storytelling. And I think that's when I said to myself, okay, I can still tell stories and I can still sing, but I can add magic in. So now it's not just a magic routine, but it's a theatrical experience. Um, so definitely magic kind of came first and then mm -hmm. I brought in the rest of my skills. And how did you find that because this is one thing that we do have in common, not the singing. Obviously, I grew up dancing. That was my, that's all I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then found magic and gave up dancing. I was like, I want to be taken seriously in magic, so I shouldn't dance. And so I just shoved it in a drawer. And then now I'm like, oh, bringing it back, putting things together. So how was that for you when you started combining singing and magic and putting that out there? How was the response to that? lay people were a little bit more like oh fascinating like you can sing and do magic especially the mm -hmm. opera at the same time wow yeah. that's so cool and then the magicians were like this is not a thing this does not work other people have tried it and failed you're going to regret this decision mm -hmm. so there have been many times over the course of my career where i thought to myself am i making a bad life choice but as I've plugged away over all the course of the years, I've realized, especially in doing magic for late people and in performing on cruise ships and things like that, and really having that exposure to thousands of people at a time yeah. and getting that time-tested result, people do enjoy it and love it. And so it was sticking to my guns and mm -hmm. not letting past people or experiences affect me that has led me to keep doing it. But it has definitely been a a head game of, should I give up? No, don't give up. It's always stick with you. It is difficult, especially when, I mean, you know a lot more magicians than I do or spend more time, I think, with magicians than I do because you live right near the Magic Castle. I've definitely like shut myself away and be like, I need to figure out what I'm doing without any like outside influence, mm -hmm. unless it's people that know me and understand where I'm going or what my journey is. Like we talk all the time about magic, but it is difficult when you're surrounded by that. And it is, 
as we know, there's a lot of men, there aren't as many women, and there are certain times where I feel like people want you or expect you to take a certain path, and you need to learn things in a certain way, and you need to go about things in a certain way, because the people before you or around you have gone about it that way. And mm. I think one of the things, especially with women, is that we are coming at magic. It doesn't matter if you purely do magic or you do magic mixed with other things. I feel like we naturally come at it from a different angle anyway, just from being women. I think slowly, 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 mm-hmm. it's now not being more accepted because it, I mean, you just got to do what you, you want to do and not be affected by other people in the business, male or female. Cause I think, you know, there's also the other side of it as well, where it's like, oh all women magicians for all the other women magicians and it's like Mm -hmm. don't get me wrong i will support a woman in magic whoever they are but Mm -hmm. i don't love every woman in magic just like i don't love every man in magic (laughs) like everyone has their taste right so moving on from magic as well and another thing we have in common oh the old adhd (laughs) so you were actually the one who said to me maybe go and check that out maybe you were very nice about it It was like just just maybe maybe look into that (laughs) maybe see i was like okay and you were right on the money um (laughs) and i didn't find out till i was what 33 34 i think but it's interesting when you find out how you realize the people close to you are either they also have adhd or Mm -hmm. they're neurodivergent in some way and that's Mm -hmm. one of the things that has kind of brought you together without you even know I mean I didn't know I didn't have a clue but I wonder how did your diagnosis come about how was that experience for you because I know for me when I found out in the beginning it was like oh this is great now I know now I Mm -hmm. can like not fix but help certain things that I struggle with because now I can find the right information the right research and then you I, well, for me, I crashed hard and was like, oh my gosh, there's so much information. There's so much out there. How do I, it's, it's too much. Now it's just overwhelming. So I'm yeah. interested in your kind of journey with that as well and how you dealt with it, like the good and the bad. You're right. It is a thing that once you find out, you're like, oh, I feel like I have some sort of control where there's been a lack of control. Yeah. Um, we never really fully have control, but <laughs> anyway, that's right. different. <laughs> We try to control things. Exactly. It's like, we're going to make it work. No, I can't make it work always. But basically for me, I had been struggling with a, a, a bunch of things. But the main thing that brought me to the ADHD diagnosis was my husband has ADHD. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to my therapist and I said, hey, like, sometimes I find it a little frustrating because I don't know how to communicate my needs and, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if they're understanding what I'm saying. How do I do that? And she said, well, have you ever read a book about ADHD? And I said, no. And she said, why don't you read this book? It's by one of the leading experts um, on ADHD. And the book is divided kind of in half. Okay. The first half talks about male experiences with ADHD and generally um, male presenting ADHD and then female presenting ADHD. So this is not a blanket statement for all people that have ADHD, but generally women tend to be the more inattentive type or a combination of hyperactive and inattentive. I was never a hyperactive child. Um, I was never hyperactive physically. I didn't realize you could also be mentally hyperactive. Um, That I am. Uh, (laughs) But everything's been in my brain, always. Mm -hmm. So I've just been very inattentive, like, whole life. Where's Cassandra? She's on the moon. Nobody knows because I love to fantasize and be my own head. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading this book and it's like girls with ADHD tend to fantasize and be in their own head. I'm like, (laughs) 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 it's like they tend to have trouble in school because they can't focus. They can't do homework. They can't do this, that, and the third. And as I'm reading this, I'm saying, oh no, this is me. Um, and that's when I took it back to my therapist and went, question mark, this is me. And she goes, surprise, now you know. <laughs> so I immediately went and saw a psychiatrist and, um, cause I, I thought about this for a second about medication, which is a whole different journey. And I said, uh, you know, do I want to be medicated? And then I thought I've lived my whole life feeling like I'm climbing through sand. Yeah. 
So why not make my life easier now if I possibly can? Like yeah. anything that will help me. So I saw the psychiatrist. I was diagnosed officially, started medication. And the day I took that first pill, I was terrified. And then yeah. 30 minutes later, I was in tears from just the sheer joy of feeling like all of the chatter in my brain had quieted to a slow, like a very low hum. Mm. And I could finally focus and I could, I just felt freer. I felt mm. like I was able to move in the world without feeling confined by my head. Yeah. And after I did that, I went through a long period of time where I kind of felt like Alice in Wonderland falling down the rabbit hole of just my whole life looked so different. And mm. I kept thinking about all the ways in which everything could have been easier and all the ways in which I wouldn't have had all the struggles I had in school, in my career, you know, various things had I known this information earlier. Mm. So like you, I consumed every bit of information I possibly could because yeah. if I can control it, <laughs> it'll be great. It, it was super helpful and I'm grateful to this day that I did that for myself and I finally made peace with my ADHD and have started to see all the benefits mm. um, to having ADHD. But that was why too, when I came to you and I noticed so many parallels and I, <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna very gently bring this to your attention because I know how jarring it can be. Mm -hmm. to then be thrown into this new reality. And I was like, if I can soften that for anyone yeah. in the future, I'm going to try. So I'm glad that you felt like it was gentle. It was, it was very gentle. You, I mean, you know me, I'm very much a just like, tell me how it is type person. Yeah. No, you were, you were very kind about it because I didn't know anything about it really. Yeah. Like it was one of those things that I might have known a, a tiny, tiny bit about it from school but it was always in like this super negative like yeah always boys it was never girls mm -hmm. um, that were mucking around in class and distracting everyone else and not settling and not working and that was it that's all I knew about it mm -hmm. and I don't even think I knew that it was ADHD or like that yeah. that word I had no clue which I guess is so good about nowadays is there's so much content online YouTube books like, I mean that's definitely something I did I would just type in ADHD, how do yeah. I do this better? Da, da, da. Cause it is, you know, it is overwhelming cause there's so much, you know, I'm not, I'll read a book, but like so many books that are written about ADHD are not written for people with ADHD. It's this thick book, tiny text. And you're like, oh, there's just, can I just, where's the bit I need right now? Mm -hmm. Like I can't change or make better all these, all these things that I want to do. Let's do it one at a time. So that was the only thing that I was like, God, I wish I was like, not an encyclopedia, but almost where you could just go this one thing, here's five things to try to help that situation. Yeah. And maybe that is a thing that will come out in the future. Um, <laughs> but no, you did send me a lot of really helpful, like YouTube clips and TikTok mm -hmm. clips that made it more fun at least. Yeah. To be like, oh, okay, I can try this thing. Or I can, you know, so it wasn't so like getting like punched in the face and be like, okay, all right, what, what else, what else, what else? Because, you know, it is a lot. And there obviously is not as much information or research on women with it, which is yeah. why so many women are finding out in their 30s, 40s later. Well, they didn't think that women, it was possible for adults to have it until the 2000s. And they didn't think it was possible for women to have it, period, until very recently. Yeah. So that's when everybody's like, everybody has ADHD now. It's like, no, actually, yeah. we just have the awareness that more people have it than you thought. Exactly. It's the same thing with like, a lot of terms that are thrown around these days. Not thrown around. I think a lot of times it, it's just now we have the, the terminology for it. Yeah. Even when, you know, talking about narcissism which is another thing we've discussed a lot <laughs> about uh like now i like knowing what that term means and the yeah. times you've experienced it same with adhd so, just so many things it is a great time to be learning about this stuff because i can't imagine going through all the things you know in the past couple of years mm. years ago 
Like I can't imagine because where there's just no nothing, no no mm -hmm. internet to like search or no, you know, it's just so it's so much more accessible these days, which makes it so much easier, and definitely has impacted me on how I then interact with other people who I go, oh, they might, there might, mm, there might be something there. And it's not my yeah. business, but at least then if you're meeting someone for the first time, you can kind of adapt a little to the way you are interacting with them. But, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a party. <laughs> it's a fun one most of the time because there are so many great things about it. Cause I, yeah. For me, like hyper focus is a major thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, procrastination is also a thing. It's like two ends of the the, the same, you know, the scale. But it's like, okay, how can you hone it? How can you use that? Because it's like if you can hyper focus on the right thing. Yeah. And I'm, you know, there's so many celebrities and like really successful people in business that do have it, and are now like sharing. Oh yeah, I have this thing, and it's like, oh, that's how you managed <laughs> to work, like. 60 hour weeks and get this thing done because there was nothing stopping you. Your brain wasn't going to let you stop, which it's is, true. you know, as we know, burnout is also a thing, it's true. Um, which I have to say, one thing that you have taught me over the past couple of years is like, just take a day, just be yeah. nice to yourself. Look at all these things you did do. Here's the list. And like, just have to take a day. It's fine. You can take a day off and yeah. not feeling guilty. But going back to lovely Ben, <laughs> I actually didn't know that well, I, I did know he had HHD, but I didn't know that he knew and then you found out about yours. Like I didn't know the order of it, which is really interesting because as far as I know, I've never dated or been married to someone who does have it. I don't think, mm -hmm. which is probably why I have uh, two failed marriages. I'm not going to lie. Because <laughs> it's such a big part of you. And if you don't know, like, the simplest things like you said like even with communication and being like this is how I feel like I don't think mm -hmm. until the past couple of years I could have even like sat down and been like this is how I feel it was like I don't know I'm just tired that yeah. was my answer to everything so with that and, and obviously for anyone that doesn't know Ben is also a magician mm -hmm. so how have you found that I guess even more so with magic do you find like because sometimes you work together sometimes you work separately and mm -hmm. how do you find that dynamic from on like a day-to-day -day basis when you're either creating or working together, traveling together? How, how is that for you? Because I know I love that like jamming, being able to talk mm -hmm. about an idea with someone who 100% gets the fact, like is in magic at least and gets that. But obviously you're both very different in your content and what you come up with. So how do you, how, how is that dynamic for you guys like on a daily basis? It's interesting because just our ADHD alone and mm -hmm. how it is very different. Yeah. Um, he, he presents a little bit more hyperactive than I do. Um, a, and with that comes different challenges. Um, so his brain, I feel like is a little bit more, I'm, I think of my brain like a spider web. His is like a spider web that's also like connected to other things. Mm -hmm. So when we're creating, it's really cool when we can let ourselves relax and just like throw ideas out. That's when it works the best. But sometimes just like we were talking about earlier with magicians having like more preconceived stuff, Ben will handle things differently because he grew up in magic. So he mm -hmm. has thoughts like that. So that brings in a structure that I don't have. Because my my brain will just go anything's possible and like kind of vibe like that. This is so great though. Like, <laughs> True. When you're like in the beginning coming up with an idea, I feel like mm -hmm. that's so great because you're not cutting ideas and like hitting the edit button straight away, which mm -hmm. I have a problem with because I go, oh, but how am I going to do that? And how am I going to? And it's like just let it be and you'll figure yeah. it out because exactly. nothing is possible when you first come up with it in magic. Yeah, it's like I um, think of it like. Um, I guess it was Michelangelo when he did David and mm -hmm. he was just chipping away at marble, right? You yeah. start with marble and then like little by little, you're chipping away at it until you get the form and then you polish it and you make the thing. So it's like when your brain is similar, but different, you come at it from different places, mm -hmm. but you can still vibe. And that's, what's nice with us. Like we'll vibe and we'll talk about things. And sometimes he'll come up with ideas I never would have thought of and vice versa. So it's really nice to have that collaborative effort. He's more of a structured business person. 
Yeah. I am not as much that. Like, I need a little bit of help there. So that's where I, like, love the fact that I can turn to him and say, hey, I don't know how to, you know, handle this thing. And he will help me with that. And then sometimes he'll be like, hey, Cassie, different. So that's what's mm-hmm. kind of nice is our brain works similar, but different enough that we can fill in the gaps. Um, nice. And then sometimes there will be moments where, we will cross boundaries with each other that we didn't realize in creation or even in our show. Like if I'm a little bit more, I have to have a little bit of a visual order to things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I get overwhelmed. And Ben is a little bit more of a control chaos. And so I'll have to say, Hey, I can't really do that right now because it's taking me out of my headspace and my game. So can we just keep our spaces a little bit separate so I can have that order I need and then we'll reconvene. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's finding that ebb and flow to be able to share something with a partner and know that even though we have the same thing, it's going to operate differently. And then sometimes irritate the other because it's (laughs) the thing that's different than what you have. So you don't understand it. Like, we talk about this in ADHD, how we have doom piles sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's like all my stuff that I know tomorrow, I'm going to go through the mail and I'm going to need this thing. And I'm going to need this random thing about whatever it is. And I'll keep it there because it's all effective and important, but yours is not good. You should not have a doom pile. Only I can have a doom pile because mine makes sense. And yours is messed. (laughs) Oh, I know exactly how this is because I'm so like, Everything has its spot, everything has a place, everything, you know, mostly has to be put away, except the thing I'm working on, because if I don't see it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. (laughs) But if someone else's mess, oh, it drives me crazy. I've got to be able to shut a door on it. Like, that's the, yeah, yeah, because otherwise I'll be working on something and it's just like, you'll just be looking at the thing in the corner. I'm like, oh, why is that one tiny thing driving me insane? But yeah, I saw you guys, when did I see you perform? Oh, Magic Castle. I came in to see you guys perform. So it's so nice that you can both go on stage and have your own moments, be 100% you, not married you, and you know what I mean? And have that moment and then come together and still share magic together on stage and share that dynamic, which is so different. Because I feel like a lot of times when you see magician couples, it's not an even balance. It's like one person, usually the man, is just so much more dominant on stage Mm -hmm. and speaking a lot more and the woman is kind of like i'm just here and it's like but i want to see i want to know what you got to say what is your like opinion on this or what it you know anything just give me something so it's nice that you both have that separate but have it together which is so much easier in the business than if you want to work together travel together it's true you know because as we know traveling and being with someone especially within the business is, is a lot it's hard it's really tough to go but this contract for six months okay yeah okay see you in six months like we know that if you know okay. what's gonna happen <laughs> so you have latin heritage mm-hmm. and do you find that influences your work at all and if so like in what ways or how are you trying to not use it but like it's part of you right so mm-hmm. as we know in magic and another thing we have in common, we're not the type of people that just walk out and like do tricks. There has to be some, give me something that's yours, like a story or a theme or something. So have you included that in any way? And if so, how? And how did you find that? Like, how did the audience like react to that? Like sharing another part of yourself with them? So that's an interesting question. I think there's ways in which it's overtly, and covertly in my work. Mm -hmm. Um, In the more covert sense, I think that I'm Sicilian and I'm Colombian. Mm -hmm. Um, And those two backgrounds are very steeped in drama. (laughs) They're both very intense. Mm -hmm. They're both very colorful and vibrant and passionate and and just dramatic. I'll say it again. And (laughs) so (laughs) that naturally flows and ebbs into performing. And as far as magic goes, magic is central to these traditions as well. Um, You know, Sicilian culture, there's a lot of Sicilian witchcraft culture, which is magic based. And then there's a lot of Colombians. We are, we like to say, (laughs) the inventors of magical realism um, because 
there was a very famous author who created that idea of magical realism. And magical realism is the idea that magic can happen in everyday life and that we don't find it odd. So if you're reading a book and somebody just floats up in the air and people are like, yeah, cool, they just float up in the air, that's magical realism. So the thought that anything is possible, I think, is something that I incorporate a lot into my work. Mm -hmm. And recently, as I've been, you know, my father is uh, an immigrant from Colombia, and as I've been reconnecting more to my heritage because it was a little bit trickier growing up, um, Latina in the United States, especially when your parent is an immigrant, because you don't have as many people around you that you can relate to, especially where I grew up, um, to that culture, I decided to infuse a little bit more of it and, and celebrate it in my work. So for instance, I'm working on a routine where I have coffee and it appears and things and talking about, you know, the fact that we are the people that brought, bring you the coffee, the best coffee. <laughs> like this is a, a homage to my father's homeland and like little, you know, the costuming is bright and vibrant and colorful and rainbowy. And that is very, you know, indicative of us as well. Um, and then recently I told a story on stage about my father and how he grew up as an immigrant and had to learn English by watching television. Um, and that is the reason why I am here at doing the thing. And also why I came to California because my dad tried to run away from New York City and jump on a train and make his way to Hollywood because he wanted to be an actor. He didn't make it, but I did. So that's the proud tradition that I get to carry on. And later on, people approached me that were in the audience and they were all Latino and they were telling me how it was so meaningful to them to hear these stories on stage, to have their daughters see a woman, a Latina woman performing on stage and being able to do something like magic. And that's what I strive to do with my work is to give the representation to these children, to these people, to this community that is my community that I never felt like I had that rep representation growing up because it just wasn't as readily available at that time in my life or at that time period. So um, I'm very grateful for my opportunity to infuse my culture into my work and to help spread it to other people. I didn't even know you could be a magician as a woman growing up. I was like, that's not a, th like, I just didn't think that was possible because I mm -hmm. never saw it. So I think it's great that you're able to use your background and put that out there so that, you know, that could change a lot of people's lives by seeing that. Hopefully as time goes by, <laughs> magic will become more and more and more inclusive. It's, I mean, it's getting there slowly, but as we know, it's, it's a, an uphill battle. If everyone can do a little bit, because I feel like that comes up a lot, like, oh, what can we do more of? What can we do? How can we help? I, I've heard that from a lot of male magicians. Like, well, what can we do? I'm like, I mean, honestly, there's nothing you can really do. Like, yeah, we're all about more opportunities for us and things like that, mm -hmm. but it's more, I think, the the women or you know anyone that isn't I hate to say middle-aged white american and male but you know what i mean yeah. you know, <laughs> any minority to just step up and be like okay i'm gonna do this and it's tough yeah. because i know i've hit points where i'm like i'm done i don't want to do this no more this is it's it's too hard it's too much work it's too much effort i don't want to have to always fight for what yeah. i want or the way I want to perform or the magic I want to do, whatever it is, I don't want the fight. It shouldn't be that hard. Yeah. But then you realize doing it can have such an impact on it. whether it's one person or 101 people, it doesn't matter, but that can really change. Not even in magic, like mm -hmm. that can change someone else. Like you could, a little girl could see you and that could be like, okay, well, I don't want to do magic, but I want to do, I want to do this thing or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is and not feeling like restricted because of where you come from. So yes. on that note, has there ever been a time when you've, uh, whether it be magic or with the singing, has there ever been a time where you've been like, I'm done. I don't, I can't do this no more. I don't want to do this. Like, have you, where has, I mean, we all have those moments of like, ah, but has there ever been like a really like specific moment that you're like, this might not be for me. And why did that like come about? And then how did you like, overcome that and be like, you know what, I'm gonna give it one last go and now you're still doing it. So it obviously <laughs> worked out. So yeah, what was, 
any anything like that, like the 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 rock bottom moment to the oh we're doing it we're peaking it's happening. I think there were a couple of rocks in the in the road for mm -hmm. me. Um, the one of the first ones was um, when I was right out of college, starting to get into magic, but mostly auditioning for Broadway shows and, and doing the musical theater route of things. I went through a period of immense ADHD burnout. Um, and I was also going through some other things that had happened. And I, I don't, we haven't talked about this a ton, um, but I also have a OCD, <laughs> all the letters. Um, oh, yes. so <laughs> I basically tried to control my voice so much to the point that I lost it. Um, and at that point, not knowing what I was gonna do with myself, I said, how am I gonna live if I can't sing? Because my voice was everything. And that's when I became so serious about magic. And I always say, you know, in many ways, magic did literally save my life because it, I was in a very low place um, when I decided that I was gonna devote myself to magic. And slowly by, you know, working on what I was working on with magic and rehabilitating my singing voice, I was able to come out of the other side of that, comma, however, just as we discussed, there are people who, and this is by no way, shape and form am I saying all men in the magic community. There are some that were not incredibly supportive and had given me a lot of things to make me doubt myself. And I went through a second period of why am I doing this? I'm just putting myself through constant torture because people are slamming doors in my face because they don't think I should be there. I mean, to be quite frank, I have literally been told, well, why, does it, why did she accept that job when we could give it to a real magician? And mm -hmm. that is, you know, after 10 years of doing magic. So that's frustrating. Um, so at that point in my life, I had said, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is not the thing to do. And to your point about representation, I also occasionally teach magic classes to children. And I was teaching a group of girls magic. And I had walked in that day and I had said, I'm your magic teacher. And they said, you can't be our magic teacher because only boys are magicians. And that's when I said to myself, I have to keep doing this, not just for me, but for them. Because mm -hmm. it's it, the only way that, that they will know that this is an option for them is if they keep seeing us and we don't give up. And mm -hmm. so that was a really great little boost on top of what I knew I needed because I do love the career to keep going and moving forward and knowing that I didn't have to listen to what other people were saying. That wasn't important. It is shocking that, because I, I doubt that was very long ago with those kids. Yeah. But that is like still a thing. Like it, it does blow my mind. Luckily, there's a lot more women doing magic on TV right now, especially yeah. the past year. There's been a lot. So at least that is being put out there. Unless it's, I guess, super commercial and you're seeing it on, you know, a show that your mom and dad watch or your grandparents watch, like, how are you going to see it at that young age? And up until this point, too, if you look at magic kits that they were, you know, parents were buying, or if you look at books, generally it was pictures of little boys with a top hat on or little boys doing a magic trick or whatever it might be. Um, like, for instance, I was in a Netflix show called The Who Was Show, and it was about Harry Houdini, this episode. And it was a show for kids. And basically they said, oh, we want a male magician. We want to bring him on to do a trick. And the kid who's playing Houdini will be pretending to do the trick and the magician will put his arms through and do it. And they'll be like, that wasn't you, that was that guy, da da da. And my manager said, you know, it could be a woman. And they were like, what? Yeah, we didn't even think about a woman. What an idea. <laughs> All we can do is keep putting out more and more content. But I, there's actually talking about that. There is one thing that came up the other day, a random conversation. I'm in this group of people. We're hanging out, having a drink. And someone introduces me to a, a new person that joined. And he's like, oh, this is Chloe. <laughs> She's a female magician. And I was like, huh? I was like, I, uh, and I'm trying to like, <laughs> 
<laughs> process what has just been said and meet this person. And I could, I was, it was such a weird thing to me because I'm like, well, one, my gender doesn't matter, but do we, do we need to say that? Like, I was like, I don't think we need to. But then I look at some things I post online and I always hashtag female magician. But that's different. I feel like that's because if you're looking for me and you don't remember my name or you're looking for another woman that does magic, what else are you going to type in? Because you're not exactly. going to put magician because it's going to be man, 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 man. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's tough because it's like, but also I'm then saying it about myself. And what, it just is weird because I would go, here's my friend, the male magician or the male yeah. doctor or the male comedian, like in yeah. person, like that is strange to me like maybe if it was an introduction not in person and you couldn't see the person maybe but yeah. it, it's still like it's strange to me but anyway that was just a random <laughs> and also like something that people just don't even realize is weird because they're just yeah. they've never seen one before so they're like she's a female magician and you're like i'm just a magician so earlier we did touch a little bit on narcissism that old chestnut and it's another thing that i think i've learned more about from you over the past couple of years we've both shared like things that have happened in our lives and, and relationships and stuff but it's another thing i never knew anything about and i think a lot of people didn't i'd never heard the term before i was like oh and i'm sharing like oh i was with this guy and this thing happened da, da, da. and it's like you'll it's the same thing it's like the age yeah. you're like i got a thought, I got yeah. a thought of that. <laughs> and it it's so crazy because then as i've dated in the past couple of years because now i'm single and dating and here and there it's being more aware of it to then be able to catch it earlier so that you're then not like, oh, a year into a relationship and you're like, oh, I've done the same thing again. And like, I'm not saying that every guy I've ever dated has been a narcissist. There's been some people that it's just like certain traits that mm -hmm. I don't necessarily love. And it's things that I wouldn't want in my partner in the future. Because you can't control another person. You can't yes. control how they act, how they treat you, anything like that. And then, you know, I've definitely been through a few... Uh, narcissistic relationships and then been on the other side and been like a total mess and not just like oh we broke up mess it's like been a couple of years and even some things now of like I don't know what a normal relationship should be I saw like a little video of this on Instagram the other day when a girl was like wait you're not going to text me every day and call me multiple times and like you're not going to be completely obsessed with me. I don't <laughs> understand like this and like, this is normal. And it's like, no, you just don't like me that much. Like, no, this is like, not like other people, like I hate to say normal, but normal people, they don't like feel the need to check up on you every day and every minute of the day and be with you all the time. And it's a really hard adjustment and something I've had to like take a step back and be alone for a while and be like, okay. And like, just, get back to zero and now I'm like okay let's maybe start dating again and be able to now be at a place where I can recognize that energy coming into my life and be yeah. like oh something feels off I don't know what it is like usually my mind can't process it but my body will go oh I don't I don't know what it is I don't know what it is but and I just go okay this isn't right for now whatever that may be and then my mind catches up in a few days and goes oh it's because of this this and this which at least is better than getting a few months in and being like, oh no, here it is again. Any, any advice or uh, uh, tidbits of information for anyone that has, you know, experienced this sort of thing? Because it's not, it, that, it's a tough thing as well because the term is being used a lot online. Yes. And I think it's the same as the ADHD thing. Oh, everyone's got ADHD now. Oh, everyone's been through narcissistic abuse. And it's like, no, we just like, know how to speak about it now and have ways of speaking about it online and exactly. why not share that so that other people men and women it doesn't matter the gender can like not feel so I don't know like alone I guess in the situation yeah. and be like oh wait this isn't just 
me and my thing, like, oh, other people have experienced this, they've dealt with it, and how they've kind of, I don't know, come back from it. Because yeah. at least in my experience, like I know with some of yours, like I was done, 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 done. Like I had no idea how to like start life again as a single person, like alone, like at yeah. all. I was like, I don't like, it was literally a step by step. Okay, today we're getting out of bed. Okay, tomorrow we're gonna go take the dog to the park. Like it was, it, it just blew my mind. And I think that was years and years of that kind of, of those kind of situations and not really dealing with it and just being like, mm -hmm. Oh, whatever. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, whatever. Oh, you know, it's a breakup. It's this, it's that. Oh, he, he only did this. Oh, he only did that. And I think that's the biggest issue with, which we've kind of touched on in personal conversations that when you're not, and this isn't like to say that anyone's experience is more or less than anyone else's. Everyone has their own situation and everyone is different, but when you're being or experiencing any kind of abuse that isn't physical, it's very easy to be like, it's not abuse. Yeah. It's just, oh, he just, you know, he just said some mean shit to me. It's very easy to just play it off like it's nothing. Yeah. And I don't think people realize how damaging it can be because you don't deal with it because it isn't like until I think more recently been seen as like a big deal. It's like, oh, whatever. She's, oh, mm. she's just... She's just butt hurt because he left her, or she's. Do you know what I mean? It's oh, she's just being bitchy. Or she, so any, I've gone off on a whole tangent again. I've got a little chit chat. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, any, anything like that would be wonderful. Oh, it's so the, welcome to my TED talk. This is what I'm one day going to get my PhD in. <laughs> yes, hundred percent should. <laughs> because uh, I've done so much research on it. Um, you know, it's funny though. The reason why I found out about narcissism in the first place was because of my mother. Um, mm -hmm. And the reasoning for that is because her stepmother, and I, I feel okay to put this out into the world, her okay. stepmother, though not diagnosed, I am certain is a narcissist. Um, and there was a lot of difficult things that both my mother and I have been through over the course of our lives together that revolved around this lady. And so in doing that research and then talking to my therapist, you know, I kind of found myself in therapy in this place of like, I am a problem. I am too much and I cause too many issues for people in my life and please help me. Like, how can I be a better person to everyone around me? And over the course of time, my therapist was like, hey, I want you to know it's not your fault. Yeah. I want you to know you've been through some things with people giving you a narrative that is not true about your life. You keep saying you're a problem. Whose voice is that? That's not your voice. Whose voice is that? And when you're forced to figure out who said that or who made you believe that truth, mm -hmm. that's when you're able to start to break down the immense wall of lies that have been built around you because that's the problem. You know, we say to ourselves, oh, I, that wasn't so bad. He just did this or that wasn't so bad. He specifically made it that way. He convinced whoever it is that you are seeing it weird. That's not what I meant. I wasn't meaning to do that. I really, I care about you. And so once you are so gaslit and gaslighting is becoming more and more of a common term as well, because a lot of people weren't aware what it means, but basically, you know, you're being sold a lie and then being told that your truth is not real. And that way you deconstruct your truth because the narcissist's whole point, and this is another important point. I think we get into a place in our society because now people are learning about narcissism that they, that people think narcissism equals a evil person. And there is a lot of black and white, but narcissism is a neurodivergence. And additionally, narcissism comes, it's a trauma response. It, it's a, it's a, personality um, disorder that comes from being left to yourself. They say that when you're a baby, if you are crying and crying and crying and no one comes to take care of you and to regulate your emotions and show you that you're safe, 
you have to tell yourself how to be safe. You have to regulate your own emotions. And that apparently is how a narcissist is born because they learn that they are their only safety, that no one else is there for them. And they're deeply insecure and they have a lot of pain inside of themselves. So they will find amazing, talented, you know, cool people and be like, I want to be like them. So they come at it kind of from a good place of like, I love everything that this person is. But then they try to suck out everything that that person has because they want it for themselves. And then once they, the person doesn't know who they are anymore because they've lost all of that, they've given it away to the other person, then they go, well, I'll move on to the next and then discard and move on to the next. And then they'll, they'll try to still keep you on the shelf and all of that stuff. I think what makes this so hard is because, again, people also don't know what the term trauma bonding means. So, you know, the narcissist meets you. And like you were saying, narcissists will be like, I love you. You're amazing. It's been two weeks, but I want to marry you. Let's run off into the sunset together. And you get so filled up with dopamine, especially us as ADHD people. That's why we love it. It's like, wow, hearts, this is amazing. <laughs> it's like every fairy tale I've ever watched like every rom-com, it, it literally, like when you realize and you have all this information and then you start, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna watch this old movie I used to love. And you're mm. like, what? Like, this is so messed up that, that like, that that's who I wanted to be. Like that woman in that movie with that guy, that's what I wanted when I was younger. And it's ridiculous. And especially like after, I, I experienced this after there was a breakup I met someone who I did not know was mm -hmm. a full-blown narcissist. Mm -hmm. I thought that I was getting my fairy tale happy ending, the guy that would say yes to everything. Like I thought, oh, finally, through all this stuff, finally, this is happening. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 nope. Like, and it, it is tough because I feel like we as ADHDers attract narcissists. Because there's is, so much yeah. we have in common, but obviously intent there is so different. Like, I want to know everything about a person and I want to connect and speak to them a lot. And, you know, I love that getting to know people and, you know, finding out like silly little things, the things they love, the th you know, how many times have I dated a guy and I find out their favorite, I don't know, drink is whatever. And that will always be in my fridge. Yeah. They come over, it's in my fridge. And that's not to manipulate them or do anything dodgy. It's like, oh, that's just a nice thing. And it's a, it's a little thing, but it's a thing that yeah. I know for me, if someone does it, it goes a long way. If I go to someone's house, they've got a Diet Dr. Pepper in the fridge. I'm like, oh, I want to marry you. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's a whole other issue. But you know, it's, it's so tough when you're getting all the things that you want that feel good, like, like you said, mm -hmm. and then dating someone that isn't that way and it feeling so slow moving, slow paced, so like not as intense, mm -hmm. which is so difficult. And it's so hard when you're so like, I'd say addicted to, but I think I definitely was for a while, like addicted to that feeling of not knowing what I was gonna get from this person, mm -hmm. which is so messed up because yeah. It doesn't feel good to be like, oh, oh. but then when you finally get the thing that you wanted or the thing that you were, you know, waiting for from them, like, oh, you don't hear from them, you don't hear from them, because that's a fun game after. Love yeah. bomb, love bomb, don't hear from them, don't hear from them. And then you finally hear from them, and you're like, oh, and you get that yeah. hit again. You're like, okay, everything's great again, everything's wonderful. And it keeps you on that roller coaster for so much longer. Yeah. And it's, it definitely, at least for me, took a while to just be like, okay, <laughs> we yeah. need to like get back to calm, quiet, and like being able to just be alone after mm -hmm. that is really tough because you're so used to having someone there. All yeah. The time. And yeah. then it's like, wait, I'm in my house alone. It's so quiet. I'm going to go crazy. And it's taken me years to be like, oh, I actually really like it. There's mm -hmm. no one like messing with my peace. Mm -hmm. Like I can just be, I can silly things that when I say them, I go, that is so weird that that it's like come to this point where I'm like, you know, I get a text at 1am from a friend and it's like, it's like, oh, oh, who's texting me at 1am? I'm like, a lot of people, because we all work late. We all, yeah. we're on shows. Like, it's not weird. I'm not doing anything dodgy. So it's, it's definitely been a, a, 
a whole journey that's definitely not over. I don't think you ever go, oh, I'm cured. Everything's great. I'm never going to feel this way again. It's not. Like, as you meet new people, whether it be in friendship or dating or whatever, I feel like you're going to hit those points again where you're like, oh, this feels familiar. This is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and I think we've definitely talked about it over the past couple of years when I've dated for a short amount of time someone. And I'm like are they? I was like, I don't think they are. They seem really nice. Yeah. And it's like, oh, there it is. Yeah. And I feel like you've, you've probably had a, an inkling on a few and you're like, oh, it's like that. How do you tell her? How do you just, because it's like, you can't know for sure. It's not like, it's true. Any, we, yeah. no narcissist is going in and getting like diagnosed. Yeah. Like in exactly. what world is that happening? So it's, it's very interesting when you said about like, going to therapy and like, I want to be better. I want to do better. I want to be better for people. And it's like, mm-hmm. we're not the problem. Like there's, there's things that we obviously want to yeah. improve about ourselves. Yeah. Like everyone, I think every good person does. Yeah. But I think because it's the only thing you can control, it's like, okay, if I could have done this, that mm-hmm. wouldn't have happened. I was like, that was going to happen no matter what. It doesn't matter. It's true. And on top of it, there's something with narcissistic abuse called reactive abuse. Um, And I was talking about this to someone earlier. It's basically when you're, you know, the narcissist is driving you nuts, right? And they're doing a bunch of bad things. Because right after the love bombing stage where they hook you in and they're like, you're amazing. Then it's the devaluation stage of like the slowly picking away at you because you know, they're insecure. They have to, and then you get those peaks and valleys and you're on that roller coaster and that's how they keep you because you're waiting for the dopamine high. So yeah. you're just like, Oh, it's coming again. Yay. And then it's like, Oh no, we're going down, but it's going to come back. And it's just, yeah. it keeps you on the thing so long. But reactive abuse is them basically driving you nuts to the point where you snap and you yell, you lose it, whatever it is. Yeah. And then they go, oh, see, you're nuts. Like this, you're the problem. Like this is why we have an issue because you're like this. And then they can say to everybody, see, see what they're like. And then you really, oh, that's yeah. meant to you. I'm the problem. I, I'm the one, I do bad things. Like it's me. It's all so like mapped out. Like it's so clear when you can see it after the fact. Yeah. But it's easier to see in other people. And that's why for me, when you were telling me things, it was easier to see that. But when I was going through my own situation, it was not as easy. And there were some people here and there that were like, hey, do you realize that this is not great? And I'm like, no, it's it's great. You don't understand. I know them better than you. They're they're trying. They're good. And you just you convince yourself of the lies that they feed you. Um And that's what trauma bonding is, is getting addicted, like you said, to those highs and lows. And once you're addicted, it's hard to let go even after the relationship's over because you're still, no matter what, even if you knew it was terrible for you, even if you don't actually want to be with them, there's some part of you in your brain that's like, but it was so intense and it was so good. Sometimes, right? It was. I think I remember it was. Yeah, and you like hold on to any good moment. It's funny how for quite a long time, I thought I was bipolar because mm-hmm. I was told I was bipolar. Oh, you're bipolar. You're, you, you know, you just go off the rails and you've got an anger, an anger problem. I'm like, I don't think I do. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. Were there times when I would like, just let things go, let it go. Doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. This thing doesn't matter. And then I would blow 100%. And that is something now that I go, okay, I'm going to share how I feel sooner rather than later mm-hmm. even if it's a small thing yeah. and just be like and if someone has an issue with that then we shouldn't be together if i can't share how i feel emotionally about something then we you are not right for me like, yeah. i need that like space to do that Absolutely. but yeah it's but then yeah you realize it's like no you're digging dig, like you're just you're poking me you're like poke 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 i'm waiting for me to pop yeah exactly and that's not my fault that's me just going, I can't do any, I can't handle anymore. Like I'm out. Um, it was very interesting because I've only ever had this experience once. And I met a girl or a woman mm-hmm. who had dated a guy that I had then dated. And mm-hmm. I didn't, we very randomly ran into each other. And I was talking to, we're at, at an event, like 
in the like green room and I'm talking to a friend of mine about a situation with this guy mm -hmm. and I was like yeah it was all really great and then all this stuff happened and then he makes the plan and he cancels I'm like I don't really know where I'm at because it was so good and he was so amazing in the beginning mm -hmm. and then I <laughs> see like you know when you like feel eyes on you and you're like yeah. should I not be talking about and I like look over and I see this woman look at me and it's like do you mean so and so and I was like mm -hmm. Do you, like so and so, the, the you know the so and so, blah, blah, blah. and she said like, yeah, and I was like yes, why? Because then you get nervous, like oh gosh, who's this person? And she's like yeah, I dated him, and I was like when? And now I'm like join the conversation, let's get a drink. And she's like yeah, I dated them up until this point, which was literally he went from her to me, oh. which is like when do you ever get to me? the the one before you or the one after you mm -hmm. and actually have be able to have this conversation so I'm like oh th let's go and she's like yeah like it wasn't really serious like it was definitely a more casual thing and I'm like okay but it's like yeah but then he would like make plans and then not and then it, it was so like same thing it was so great and intense in the beginning it was amazing and then mm -hmm. like then he would just make plans and then just like not show up or just like cancel last minute or make excuses. I'm like, then why is he even making plans? Because mm -hmm. he did the exact same to me, thing to me. The difference is at the beginning, I, you know, when we we're having drinks or first couple of dates, I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm at a place where I'm ready to date someone like seriously again, like mm -hmm. to be in a relationship or find the one or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, me too. You know, I did the whole, you know, he was divorced as well so we had that in common we were able to share that <laughs> hashtag trauma bonding yeah. and, then, and he you know he's like, oh I did the rebound and you know the the hooking up and whatever I did all that and I was like okay a decent amount of time has passed maybe this is this is great maybe this is going to be wonderful and oh it was so great and I it turned so bad so quickly which, which is great at least at least it was only like a few months of my life that mm. kind of went into this yeah. and yeah it was you know then the ex was back in the picture which I have to say at least one thing that I did do which I think younger me might not have done was when we we sat down for a drink this was a couple months in and he was like so my ex wants to come and like moved to Vegas and da da da. We broke up because of long distance. And I lit I remember being sat at the bar with like one leg on him and mm -hmm. having a drink. And I literally was like, my body, not even my mind processed what he said. My body just went, oh nope, nope, nope. <laughs> right here. And he was like and if I didn't know at the time, like now looking back, I'm like, oh this should have been the little like ding ding moment mm -hmm. was when he was like, really? And I was like you just told me your ex is about to move here to possibly be with you. And the fact that I moved my leg off you, <laughs> attitude, are you kidding? And I was so torn because I mm -hmm. felt so much for him so quickly. Yeah. And it was like this, I literally had to have a fight with myself because part mm -hmm. of me was like, oh, but we want what he is giving. I want mm -hmm. that. I want the good feeling. I want, he was so like, I don't need a lot of like verbal validation, but mm -hmm. he was saying the right things. Yeah. That I was just like, oh, I really like that. I really like that he supports this and da da da. And then I'm literally in a hotel in, you know, like in the casino at a bar. And I'm like, you have to leave. My body's going, just yeah. leave, just leave, just leave. And I'm like, yeah, I, I think I'm, he's like, oh, should I walk you to a car? I'm like, I think I'm good. Yeah. And then I literally sat in my ca car and was like, I, and I felt so upset and so angry but then yeah. I was like and then we ended up meeting up about an hour later in the same place and had a conversation because I was so mad yeah I was like wait there's a time to let it go and there's a time to be like what 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 happened why would you and I get like you know at the time I was like oh well you know like maybe he's meant to be with his ex and I try to you know I believe in love and like people being together and you know I would never want to get in the way of that with someone else mm -hmm ever like I've dated people like in the past that have had kids with their past relationships mm -hmm. and I go I would never get in the way of that relationship yeah. because you know my mum and dad were never together it was just mm -hmm. you know it, they were always separated but it, so 
as a child on that end of that, it's like you just see things differently as, as an adult. Really? But it just, I was so torn. It was like two, two different parts of me. Like I wanted to be angry and be like, fuck you and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then the other part of me is like, no, but we really like this one. Like this one we really like and we think he's a good guy. And like, yeah, because of all the things he did in his life and work yeah. made me go, how, how can you be doing this in your, your work mm-hmm. life? and be this way you know and there's so much more to it I'm, I'm, I'm you know yeah. I, I can't yeah. so much yeah but it's just like so now I realize I need to listen to my body before I listen to my head because my yeah. head will talk it's like oh la, la, like because in half the time I don't think it's even my voice in my head oh yeah I think it's all these voices I've heard over the years that no. have been like oh it's not that bad oh it's you know oh he's just oh but he says this or oh, at least it's not that and now finally getting to a point where my body can go if my body goes Ugh, i'm like okay we, we we did we need to listen to this and this means getting away and like not allowing someone else to have an opinion or mm-hmm. talk me out of however i'm feeling and yeah. being i have to go alone and think about that and be like what is happening to your body right now what is going on because i haven't gotten to a point where it's instant like body to head mm-hmm. but i've gotten to a point where it's body, I sit, I'm alone, and I go, okay, yeah. what is going on here? And knowing that I need that, and maybe that will always be the way, who knows? Yeah. But at least, you know, it's so hard when you're stuck in a space with someone and it's just like, and you're like, I can't, it's like, and mine, and I'm like, and mine obviously, you know, when someone's talking to you, your own thoughts get, you know, muted. Yeah, it's true. And it's so tough, but but yeah, I mean, We'll see. We'll see what the future holds. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> to that point, like, it's hard because a lot of times the point of the abuse of a narcissist is to separate that mind and body connection because if they can confuse you enough, they can keep you from ever really seeing who they are because that's, that's the biggest fear. The biggest fear for a narcissist is for you to remove that mask and then to know that they are the insecure, weaker person that they know themselves to be. I even, I was was telling somebody this earlier, but my ex who I believe was narcissistic, um, he at one point, I thought he had self-awareness. Like he would say to me, oh, but... I think you I think you need to move on. I think you need to find someone better that's that's not gonna hurt you because I'm a bad person and and it's it's my fault and da da da. And then I went to my therapist and I was like, but I think he had some self awareness because he said and she goes, Yeah, and then did you say, Oh, but no, you're not a bad person and I don't think that about you and I love you and I said, Uh huh And she goes, Yeah, that, that was the point of that speech was to get you to say that. And I was yeah. like, Oh, got it. <laughs> you got exactly what he wanted exactly from... and it's building us building that self-awareness to know that when the next one like that comes in and we go oh my body's telling me the truth like whatever you're telling me even if you're trying to convince me that this is not the truth i know myself this is the truth yeah it's definitely that actions speak louder than words mm-hmm. on like a really like massive level like yeah. ridiculous level of like they're very, very good at saying what you want to hear or what you need to hear to get what they want. They're experts. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm not a, you know, I'm somewhat smart in some areas, but I feel right. like it, <laughs> I'm all right. I get by. I feel like I don't always articulate how I feel or what I need in the best way. So mm-hmm. that's like the, my own thing that I have to work on. But it's when someone is very clear, it's like, oh, okay. Like, I know what I need to do. Like, it's just, rea- you know, you just react. Okay, great, great. It's okay. But um, it's very interesting because that the same guy, we actually had a conversation a few weeks after that happened. Mm-hmm. Things didn't work out with the ex, whatever. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, you just wanted to hook up. And then she was off again. Like, I feel mm-hmm. it. You just wanted that freedom, which is fine. Like, at that point, we were still, it was still kind of new. Like, uh, it, it's tough, right? It's tough yeah. when you go, well, it hasn't been very long, but we're seeing each other a lot. We're really going quickly. So it's hard to be like, well, you know how it is. 
and we had a conversation and I think I said something along the lines of, you know, I don't think, I, I think I was expressing how he was making me feel about mm -hmm. everything. And I was like, well, this has made me feel this way. And that's why, you know, I reacted in the way I did. And that's why I just walked off and left. Cause I didn't just, well, I didn't just walk off. I told him where I was going. I was like, you know what, I'm out. I've got to, I'm going to go deal with this feeling. Mm -hmm. And he did not like the fact that I was like holding up a mirror and being like, these things that you did mm. made me feel this way. And it's one of those, what, what do people say? Oh, I've had it said to me all the time, the, um, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Oh yeah. Or I'm like, that's Which not an apology. Okay. No. That is not an apology, is it? <laughs> like, mm, no, you, you did that. Like this is, you know, you may not like how I feel. You may not have intended to make me feel that way. If, yeah. if we're going, you know, benefit of the doubt, but you did. So mm -hmm. just, learn to say sorry it's not yeah. that hard i'm british i apologize more times in a day <laughs> than anyone like than any other like <laughs> place like it's just in us to like you know you bang into it oh you know they bang into you oh sorry what i didn't even anyway <laughs> but it's yeah it was very interesting that it got turned around really quickly and then i felt guilty mm. I'm like what i didn't do nothing wrong i was lovely i did I like, oh my God. And some of the silly things that I like then got him like a birthday cake when we'd broken up and mm -hmm. I can't, it was just, I mean, we did, we did date for like one more date and I was, at least it was cut shorter than a lot of the past ones. And I learned a lot, but yeah. it's, it is just, I don't know. It's, it's yeah. nice to be on the other side and at least be able to recognize it. Like you said, and I've even had to do this very recently with a friend, a male friend, mm -hmm. who he, the text that she came through, I was like, I think I'm dating a narcissist. And I was like, let's get on a call. What's this about? <laughs> and it was crazy because I'd only ever experienced it up until that point with a man mm -hmm. and never a woman, mm -hmm. at least knowingly. Because I, you know, it, it, he was, yeah. he's a uh, straight guy, dating a girl. And he would share the things he would, she would say. And it's the same thing. It's like, it's the love bombing and the, and it just, thank goodness it, it's done. It was, it was like a week and, and, you know, it was a very quick in and out situation. And then she like reached out to his dad, like on Instagram, there was a, there was a whole thing I was like, what is going on. Like just any which way to like stay in someone's life because he very quickly cut it off and was like, Mm, it's not for me. And yeah. I think what was great about that conversation, though, was that he would text me what he was going to text her. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're not, you're not being clear. And he said, what do you mean I'm not being clear? I was like, be clear and precise. Don't be like, yeah. well, I don't think we should be doing that. No, 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 no. Be very direct, like, yeah. Just be direct, because otherwise she's going to text you again tomorrow and the next day. And that's not even a thing to do with, like, narcissistic situation yeah, just, in life, really. yeah, it's yeah, just in life just be direct because I feel like I learned in that moment a lot and he did too because he's like wait I've said this to other women in the past I'm like yeah and you wonder why they're still like blowing up your phone and like <laughs> not understanding like just be direct like for me I'd rather someone be brutally honest mm -hmm. hey this is not working out for me mm -hmm. I don't really need a reason at this point <laughs> at 30 whatever I am like if it's not working for you done don't waste my time yeah you know like I'd rather you know, I, I feel bad for anyone that's like goes on a first date with me because it's like, here's everything. Yeah. Here is so much. We're past too much information. Just like, here's all the information. You let me know how you feel about all these things because I don't see the point of stretching it out yeah. and us wasting each other's time. Because there's certain things people are just not going to be on board with, right? Yeah. Or, you know, and whatever. They're not. They're not the right person. Exactly. So it's just brutal honesty. Love yeah. that. It's so good. And it's such a hard thing to learn when, especially like, I know for me, I come from a place of being more of a people pleaser. And so it's like, oh no, I don't want to upset someone. But I realize now that that is a recipe for disaster, especially yeah. in relationships. And like, yeah. if you're not very clear about your boundaries and you're, you, even with the most well-meaning person that is not maybe a narcissist, it's just a person in your world and they step on your toes in whatever way, if you keep resenting it and pushing away, you're just gonna 
react later and then they're going to be confused and nothing positive is going to come out of that. So clarity is immensely important. It's a hard practice when you're not used to it, but it's so important. Yeah. I think that made me think of one thing that you are the first person that's done this with me. And now I like make sure it's on all my friendships is when I'm like, this thing is happening and I'm really, I'm upset or I'm angry or I'm stressed or whatever the thing is, you always ask if I want advice or support. So if I want you to just be like, oh, well, screw that guy and da da da, or you want like, like if I want actual like a thought or like some kind of, oh, have you thought about it this way? Or is, you know, what about this? Check this out. And you always ask. And I now do it with not just friendships, like, if I get into another relationship with someone, I would always do it. Yeah. And I think it helps so much because I feel like I've had so many like mini arguments with people where they're like, well, I, do, I don't need to fix it. I just want the you're right or that sucks or whatever it is that makes you go. Yeah. Yeah. I was right. <laughs> like, whatever <laughs> it is, you know, stupid. be like, oh, someone cut you off on the freeway and you just need someone to be like, well, screw that person for doing that. That's yeah. all you need sometimes is someone yeah. to be on the same page with you. Yeah. And that's it. Like you don't always need like fix, fix, fix. Exactly. But it's, um, it's, uh, although usually if I'm <laughs> WhatsApping you a 10 minute voice note, it's like, it's, this is advice time. This is not validation time. This is what, what what's, what do I do here? What's yeah, you're usually <laughs> just like, just, just tell, you could just tell me like, yeah, tell, out. Just tell me what to do. <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to do it now. But um, it's true. But, and I feel like that comes me doing that and learning that is a byproduct of feeling controlled. And I think it's, you know, even in, in a friendship where they love you um, and they want to help when you're talking to somebody and they're like, but I got the solution. Here's the solution. There have been so many times where that has instantly made me feel like you didn't hear what I said. I, I don't know that you know what I'm talking about. So it's mm -hmm. like, if I, if you can come at it from a like, hey, do you actually need me to be fussing around in your life and fixing things? Or do you want me to just be like, yeah, you go, you do the thing. Yeah. I think that that's, it's, it's, it's so tricky because I think the way it boils down for anything in life is communication is key. Yeah. The more you are clear, the more you tell people how you feel. Like even now I've just started doing things where I'll flag Ben, like if I'm in a mood or something and be like, Hey, sorry, I'm in a mood. I love you. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm being a little, a little bit just iffy. Um, and I will apologize again later, but just so you know, that's where I'm at. And I need you to kind of not, <laughs> not challenge me at this moment. Like we can that have so <laughs> you go playing field when I've calmed down. <laughs> a very nice way of being like don't do anything that's gonna set me off just go just go be just go be in the next room don't touch anything don't break anything yeah, need like, a I'm hungry and i'm just gonna yell to yell so like just if you yeah. just go sit in the other room you'll be out of the fields of fire like <laughs> you're good you know that like you've got into a place of like knowing to just you know how you feel you can express it yeah he gets it got it you know so it's and even that takes work to get to that place and be yeah. like, oh, I like to recognize your own feelings and not just be like, oh, I blew too late. Yeah. Oopsie. Sorry about that. But, what I was always doing was repressing, repressing. It's like, no, yeah. no, no, I'm the problem, I'm the problem, the problem. And then finally I blow and then it just be everything that I've ever been bothered about ever. And then it leaves people feeling like, wait, what? Where did that come from? So if you say it in the moment, then yeah. people can follow you and, and adjust behavior accordingly. Additionally, to go back to an earlier point, you said, um, they say that when you're in a narcissistic relationship, generally, because that kind of relationship is what you've had for so long, mm -hmm. that's what feels safe. So anything that feels like, you know, oh, this is like, more healthy and it's slower moving, it feels not right. And I think that was also something too, I ended up having to learn is like, oh, this is a person that's on your team. This is not a person that's like, you know, going after you. So it's gonna feel different. And yeah. that is 
that is even better than what yeah. you thought that like intense emotion was. That was nothing. That was imagined. Like I have to keep reminding myself, and this is one of the hardest parts I think about going through this stuff is all of that story and all of that intense emotion and romance and da 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 and that person, they were not real. That was not real. It was yeah. a thing that happened. It was a, a, a fabricated circumstance that they built and a fabricated identity that they made for you in order to say, hey, this is exactly all the specifications that you have given me from all the information you've given me of exactly what you like so that yeah. I can be that person for you. But really, they're just tricking you. So... Yeah. It is hard to, it's hard to break that pattern. It's, I mean, it, I guess in any area of your life too, like familiar always feels better in the beginning because you're like, oh, this, I know this, my body knows this. Like, even if it's not necessarily a good feeling, like the familiarity like over compensates for that. Yeah. So any new, any change, it's like, oh, you know, you get that like, oh, this is new. I don't know how I feel about it. Whatever it may be, whether it's relationship new job whatever yeah. and it's tough to be like okay this is this feeling is just about the change it's not bad it's not a bad feeling but that it's hard to like recognize the difference and be like oh no no this is this is change change is good change is a good thing let's get used to that let's you know and i mean i hate change I can't stand it. Oh, it drives me crazy. I'm trying more and more to be like, change is good, change is good. <laughs> like, I mean, that's a control thing too. That's a wanting to have control of what's happening to you, to yourself, to your life, whatever. But, but I mean, at this point, all the change has been good. In the, any any change that's happened in the past few years, I'm like, it's it's even if it's not worked out in the way I've thought, it's at least worked out in my either in my best interest or it's got me to, okay, that didn't quite work out, but then that led me to this thing, yeah. which is even better. So True. I don't know, sometimes you just got to let it go and let, you know, lose control a little bit and just see what happens because yeah. I don't know, not, you know me, I'm not the most religious or the most spiritual or mm -hmm. anything like that, but I do believe like whatever your path is, like it will work out for the best for you in the end. Yeah. If you just, let it stop fighting it and let it be yeah but, like, um, I, always, I always say that to you is like whatever is meant for you won't pass you by and yeah. it's like it's hard to allow yourself to free fall into those situations and give up that control but when you do you start to see your life evolve in so many ways and you've evolved in an incredible amount of ways and i feel like i've also involved in a lot of good ways and so like yeah it's good it's good to to give up control it's hard but it's good. <laughs>